Good morning and happy Easter. It is such a joy to gather this morning to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Easter is a season that's filled with all kinds of bright colors and flowers and family. And it seems no matter what your family schedule is uh, today, everyone makes time for church, right? But for whatever reason that brings you here today, we welcome you. We're grateful for the opportunity to worship our Lord's resurrection together. We are all part of the family of believers, the people of God, so welcome to one and all. Welcome. I want to read to you Luke 24. It begins this way. On the first day of the week at early dawn, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. You know, the circle of women came early that Sunday morning. They had their spices in tow. They went to the tomb. They were expecting death, expecting hopelessness, but instead what they found was life. When Jesus was buried on Friday, everything was rushed. Sundown was not too far away, and then it was going to be Sabbath. This was the first opportunity that people had to return to the tomb. It was the final little piece of kindness they could do for Jesus to prepare his body. They're, they're still numb from the weekend, from the past day's events. It had been so fast, like a whirlwind. Jesus was arrested and tried. He was condemned to die. He was beaten. They saw Jesus at Golgotha, a man they probably barely recognized. He was bloodied and bruised and sweat and blood streaked his face. He looked shattered. He looked spent. And then they had to watch him die. Mercifully, he died in only a few hours. His body was moved to a tomb nearby. And now the women, they're on their way and they're burdened with their spices and, of course, their grief. And when they arrive, things aren't as they expect. The, the stone had been rolled away from the tomb and they crept timidly inside and Jesus' body isn't there. Two men are standing there instead. They have a heavenly appearance. Their clothes are white and dazzling. Why are you here, they said. Why are you looking for the living in a cemetery? Jesus isn't here. He has risen from the dead. It was all too amazing to believe. They look around the tomb. There's no body, just a linen shroud. They remembered how Jesus had said this was going to happen, and it did just as he had said. Jesus prophesied that he would be killed, and then he would rise from the dead, and they remembered his words and it had occurred exactly the way he said Jesus had defeated death. The women went and they told the disciples, but the men dismissed it because it just all seemed too impossible. And maybe this is where we are too. I mean, doesn't resurrection seem impossible? How sad for the women. You know, their burial preparation was immediately replaced with hope and joy. And the moment they run back and bust down the doors and tell the disciples, they're met with disbelief. Easter hope had turned immediately into what? Maybe you've also had a resurrection experience in your life. You know, do you remember? I don't know. Do you remember? Do you remember a resurrection experience? I mean, there was a moment where you were alive and excited about Jesus. Maybe it was hearing the Bible for the very first time. You were touched and you said, yes, I want to live for him. Or, or perhaps you had a resurrection experience because you went through a difficult time and you saw God's hand leading you out and pulling you out of darkness. God raised you out of the pit and then you said, yes, I, I want to live for him. Or perhaps you just had that moment you were born again, you accepted Christ into your heart, in one way or another, you were touched by the Holy Spirit and you were made alive with Jesus. And you can identify with the women, right? You can. You can identify with the women on this first Easter morning. You had hope and excitement, but now you're here a little later. Maybe the initial excitement has worn off and you find yourself asking, how real was that experience? 
Did any of it really happen? Now you are on the other side of resurrection. Because it seems to wear off, doesn't it? The excitement, the joy, all the plans we make, the initial rush. It seems life is like that. You know, something new comes along, a project or a new job or a new toy, and we have all this excitement over it. But then, after a little while, real life kind of wins over, and we go back to the other side. It's tempting to go back to where you were. It's tempting to go back to who you were. It's tempting to go back to what you were doing. And that was true for the disciples. Easter took place, and unexpectedly, they all saw Jesus alive. In John chapter 20, it says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, Even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. They saw Jesus alive, and then he left. (laughs) Think about that for a moment. I mean, before Easter, the disciples were fishermen, and Jesus chose them, and then even then they were only kind of so-so disciples. They rarely understood what Jesus was saying. His parables confused them. Even when he walked on water, they didn't recognize him. And on the Friday Jesus died, the disciples all scattered. They, They were told that this was going to happen, but they didn't understand, and now life seemed hopeless. But then Jesus appears alive, and they're joyful. They're hesitantly hopeful. And just as quickly as he came, he's gone again. And now they're wandering by the Sea of Galilee. There are no more appearances. Jesus is gone. They're on the other side of Easter. The excitement and the newness has begun to wear off. Sunday became Monday. Monday becomes Tuesday. The disciples are tempted to go back to where they are. They are tempted to go back to who they are. They are tempted to go back to what they were. They are tempted to let things go back to normal. John 21 says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two others of his disciples were together, and Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Life is going back to normal. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. Those are probably the saddest words ever spoken in the Bible. Because when he says this, when he says, I am going fishing, what he's really saying is, it's all over. It was a great run, but it's over. There's nothing left now but to go home and go back to the old life, go back to what we used to do before. With Jesus gone, things will never be like they once were. They will forever be a hole in their heart. Fishing will never be like it was with Jesus. Nothing can ever be like that again. So they're going to be homesick, remembering how things used to be. Fishing's not going to bring that same fulfillment. And and for a few years, Peter got to experience life. And, And it was a life that he never dreamed was possible. And now... He has to go back to work. He has to go back to making a living. So Peter went fishing. And the Bible says the other disciples joined him. Things were going back to normal. 
And the Bible says they fished all night. And they caught nothing. Not even one little fish. Imagine the scene on that boat. I mean, look at Peter's face. What do you see? Do you think he's happy? Do you think the smell of the lake and the fish invigorate him? Is he light on his feet? Is he laughing? Is he joking around with his friends? Does it feel like a homecoming for him? No. It feels like a funeral. But watch as hope returns to the story. In John chapter 21, it says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? What a question! And this coming from Jesus. I mean, he's the man that knows everything. He knows the answer. Jesus knew how the disciples were feeling, but he wasn't really asking about fish, was he? He was asking, hey, did your work produce any fruit? Are you happy? Is your work bringing you joy? Do you really want to go back to how things used to be? He could ask us the same question today. Friends, do you have any fish? Is your work producing fruit? Are you happy? Is your work giving you joy? No, the disciples answer. What would be our answer to Jesus? Remember, you were once worldly and carnal and striving for things that would make you happy, doing whatever feels good, living by your own power, for your own purpose, to please yourself. You may have even thought you were happy once, but then you met Jesus and he changed your life and he gave you hope. You experienced Easter. You experienced resurrection. And then he gave you purpose and real joy and hope, even in the middle of your trials. You knew the abundant life, the purposeful life, the feeling of walking with Jesus and feeling the joy and the happiness that it brings. You saw walls fall down. You experienced victories over temptations and habits. You were living the abundant life. But then something happened. Then it became Monday. And then Tuesday. And now you're right back where you were living for yourself, living for moments of pleasure, living without a sense of God's presence. And it seems like God is either far away or he's gone. This is where the disciples are. They're back on the boat, joyless, living as if there's no Jesus, living as if there's no hope. What can we learn from the disciples? After you've been with Jesus, you can't go back to where you were. You can't go back to who you were. You can't go back to what you were. Or, you know, others of you may be thinking, yeah, I got saved, but none of that ever happened to me. I, I never felt rescued from my old life. You got stuck between Good Friday and Easter. Yeah, I think a lot of Christians get stuck there. So what's the good news? God doesn't want you to be there. So Jesus doesn't leave them there. He goes to them to bring them back to the right side of Easter, the side with the joy and the purpose and the happiness. It continues, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. I think that boat represents our lives. Jesus is telling us that we are trying to find our purpose and our meaning on the wrong side of life. We are living our lives on the wrong side of Easter. So what do the disciples do? They listen, they obey. 
So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. What happened when they obeyed? Overflowing nets, overflowing lives. They fished all night, no hope, no fish. But one act of obedience, one cast later, and they bring in the haul of a lifetime. What was the difference? Right side versus wrong side. On the wrong side of my life, there is emptiness and defeat and failure and hopelessness and lack of joy, lack of victory, same old, same old, day in, day out. Because on the wrong side, there is no Jesus. But on the right side, we find fullness and victory and success and fulfillment and peace and hope. This morning, we need to remember that our lives will find meaning and purpose on the right side of Easter. Let me give you an example. Probably would not surprise you, but Christians can also experience trials in their marriage. Our, our boat can experience waves and rain. The wind can rock the boat sometimes, and sometimes the water even feels like it's just coming up all around us. And if the couple is trying to face those storms alone, they are living on the wrong side of Easter. On our own willpower, on our own strength, resorting to blaming and resentment and anger, that is not where Jesus wants us to be. Life like that for too long, hope begins to dwindle and you give up and you convince yourself things aren't going to change. This is how it's always going to be. But Jesus would tell you, cast your net on the right side of the boat and then you'll get results. You are not alone. You do not have to face the wind and the waves alone. Realize that God is with you, alive and powerful. There was hope for the tomb on Easter and there is hope for your marriage. God wants to see you succeed. He will help you. He will guide you. He has a plan for your life. And that includes the marriage that you are in. It includes the children that are in your home. Don't give up. Don't throw it away. Go to God and pour out your heart. Let him know how it feels. Tell him you don't want to fish on this side of the boat. Not without him. Go to him. Maybe it's not your marriage. Maybe it's your finances or your job. Maybe it's education or your retirement or your health. You know what I'm talking about? It's a storm. It's wind. It's waves. It's doldrums. It's defeat. It's pushing the same rock up the hill day after day and never getting anything done and feeling like your to-do box is always way too full. You know what Peter did? I love what Peter did. When the nets are full and about to break, he recognized Jesus, and what did he do? No hesitation, no stopping, no thinking. He went to Jesus. It says, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The heck with nets, the heck with fish, the heck with water. <laughs> Only one thing mattered, being with Jesus. Peter discarded the old life so fast, he jumped in face first because he knew it was better to live on the right side of Easter. What waited for him on the shore was more than a man, more than a teacher. In Jesus, he saw hope and joy and purpose and meaning. He saw life, a new life, a better life, and nothing on earth was going to stop him.
You know, my greatest joy on Easter is seeing all of you. Rows and rows of smiling faces and everyone is glad for the holiday and you all look great and I know you all have exciting plans for the rest of your day. But we all know that tomorrow life goes back to normal. Easter will be over. Someone has to pay the bills. Someone has to take the kids to school. Life goes on. That's true. That's true with any holiday. That's true with any vacation. Eventually, the good times end. But for some of you, this trial has been going on for a little too long and you've fished all night and you've caught nothing. Let me tell you something. If the tomb is empty, then the promises of Jesus are not. A day that began in despair ended in joy. Tell me something, do you know what's better than a great breakfast? I'll tell you, a great breakfast when somebody else cooks it for you. Our fishing story ends with just such a breakfast. It says when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Even though they had just caught a bunch of fish, Jesus didn't need any of them. He didn't need their work. He didn't need their offering. And they wouldn't have to wait for the fish to be prepared or cooked. Breakfast was already made. And in that moment, I'm sure that meal was more than just bread and fish. It was the joy of everyone being back together again and all the hope that tomorrow would bring. You see, that's what we need from Easter. Not brightly colored clothes or eggs and not even lunch at Grandma's house. We need hope. I need hope in my house. What about you? Hope is connected to the future. Hope informs us that tomorrow has purpose. It has promise. It assures us that sorrows and difficulties, the things that we face today, they're not the final answer. Hope promises that the future is full and abundant. It gives us motivation to live. This morning, Easter, is the reason for our hope. See, in his death, Jesus became the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, all the selfishness, all the deceit, all the brutality, all the despair of every time and place. He carried it all with him and he took it all to the grave. And in dying, he killed every last sin, every offense with arms wide open. He carried it all. And then on Easter morning, he defeated death. Friday was the end. Jesus returned on Sunday, and that brought a new beginning and a new week. Friday in the cross, they did their best to snuff out hope. But on Sunday morning, Jesus, Jesus demonstrated a hope that darkness could never overcome. Jesus' resurrection on Easter morning declares the reality that Jesus makes all things new. The women came to the tomb first, Easter morning. They found it empty, and that empty tomb symbolizes our great hope. You know, during this season, it's crucial to make sure that our hope is in Him. It's absolutely essential that we quit fishing on the wrong side of the boat. In fact, my prayer for you this morning isn't even found in the Easter story. It's found much later in the book of Romans. Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Yes! 
I want you to abound in hope. My prayer is that you abound in hope. Not money, not health, not success, not fame. Why? Because that's what our world needs most. It's what you need most. In a world of lack and sickness and failure and forgottenness, what everyone needs right now more than anything else is hope. I want to encourage you today. Have hope. Share hope. You may be facing the toughest season, the biggest test of your life. And if you have Jesus, then deep inside you have hope. And all it takes for you is to stop living and fishing by your own power. Listen to Jesus and cast your net on the other side. You can face suffering and sacrifice and setbacks with hope. And best of all, while you're doing it, you'll be giving hope to everybody else around you. Someone was quoted as saying, we can live 40 days without food, eight days without water, four minutes without air, but only seconds without hope. We need hope in our lives. And while the hope the world offers is based on our wants and desires, things that don't satisfy, things that fail, the hope that scripture talks about is different. The hope is defined as an expectation that's all based on the promises of God. This hope is different. We have hope that is eternal and it won't fail us. The book of Hebrews says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. The hope that God offers is something that we build on. It's an anchor. It keeps us firm during all this and all that. It's the rock which the Christian stands, unmoving, unshaken. This is the hope of God, and this hope is forever bound up in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The work that was done on the cross, the very symbol of death. Jesus took the epitome of hopelessness and turned it forever into a symbol of hope. For the believer and for everyone who believes, Jesus walked out of the tomb. That's the hope we have. Peter writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. There is hope for us. There's hope for us and there's hope for you. Let's pray. Lord, as the world sings triumphant cries to heaven over death that you conquered, help us, Lord, tomorrow as well. When the dresses are all put away and the candy is all eaten and on with life we go, let us not forget the celebration of your resurrection over death is a celebration of life that can continue well beyond the services and the music, beyond the sign of spring, beyond the lily, beyond lambs grazing in fields. Resurrection is a, a daily celebration over fear, over our greatest and the most powerful enemy. The fear of tomorrow, the fear of yesterday, the fear of what shall become of our young and our old. Your resurrection replaces fear with love. And this alone is the most touching and profound of your signs, that fear is dead and belief in you brings not just hope, but life. Lord Jesus, by your radiant and magnificent resurrection, you broke the bonds of death and rose from the grave as a conqueror. You reconciled heaven and earth 
Our life had no hope of eternal happiness before you redeemed us. Your resurrection has washed away our sins, restored our innocence, and brought us joy. How immeasurable is the tenderness of your love. Amen. We're so glad that you came out to worship with us, to celebrate Easter with us. Perhaps you're asking, okay, so where do we go from here? After the resurrection, at the very end of the gospel stories, the book of John, he records, Now Jesus did many other signs and wonders in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Next week, that is where we're going to begin. We're going to take a few weeks and we're going to look at all of the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus did and consider and learn about the hope that each one of them brings. And I hope you join us. We would love to be the church where you live. Have a happy Easter.